mission for all of us here at ULA, for all of us, um, for our customers um, with ESA and NASA. This is definitely a monumental mission. Um, so it's, it's, we're honored to be able to support this mission. Um, it's a huge international collaboration with the European Space Agency, uh, the Airbus um, Corporation that, that manufactured the spacecraft, and then um, NASA Goddard who provided some instrumentation on the spacecraft, and our partners with NASA LSP who facilitated all the integrated, uh, all the integration between all these teams, and so it just been really great working with just a whole variety of folks, um, certainly folks from all kinds of uh, backgrounds, from um, various countries throughout Europe. So this has been a huge mission for us, very exciting. Um, and for this mission, it's really a unique configuration for the launch vehicle. It's flying on our Atlas V. Uh, 411 configuration, and so what that means is um, our nomenclature for the number scheme of how we designate these these vehicles. Uh, four, the very first uh, digit in the nomenclature stands for is the diameter of the payload fairing. So it's a four meter diameter fairing. We also have five meter fairings. So those uh, that class of vehicles are referred to as our 500 series. The second digit is the number of solid rocket boosters on uh, the vehicle. So this mission has one solid rocket booster. And we'll talk about that in a little bit because that's really counter counterintuitive and unique looking because it just doesn't look like it should fly right. And then the last digit, the additional one, is the number of RL-10 engines on our Centaur second stage. So we've got one RL-10 engine. Um, that's really our standard for uh, the Centaur III flying on an Atlas V. However, we do have unique configurations uh, for other missions where we do fly a dual-engine Centaur, which was just done um, this past December for the first time not in Atlas V, so that was exciting. But 411 configuration, uh, you'll notice when it takes off on the pad, as it's lifting off, you'll notice that the engines on the Atlas V are actually going to vector towards that SRB to make sure it's staying um, straight up uh, in its launch path, in its trajectory. And so it's a little counterintuitive to think about um, the fact that you've got this engine mounted on the side. It's actually canted, so you'd think it would be pushing it like this. And then you have the main engines also angled at the same um, angle. And you'd think it would just double the force to thrust it like this and however when you really start to think about it you have your vehicle like this your center of gravity you can think of it as a pivot point on my hand so think of that as fixed and then you have the SRB mounted off center of that SRB the bulk of the force is going like this so you can think of tying a string to my finger and pulling up and it's going to pivot around that axis now like I said, it's canted a little bit, so it's providing some x-force in this direction, so it actually offsets that pivot to the right and causes it to pivot back around a little bit. But those forces don't balance out, because otherwise that solid rocket booster wouldn't be contributing to the lift, and that's what we want. Um, so the main engines then pivot with it to counteract that force, so now you have a balancing of forces um, to correct the rocket's tra trajectory to go straight, um, but provide the added thrust required to meet the customer's requirements uh, to place it in the right order. And that's the thing that's really exciting about Atlas is it's just so configurable. It's configured to meet all of a wide variety of customer requirements. Um, so like I said, we have two different payload fairing diameters, um, and then we have a variety of uh, solid rocket boosters we can attach on the rocket, and so that's that's to, to enable us to accommodate a variety of spacecraft masses, sizes, and orbital requirements. Um, and with this one, it's a very unique orbital requirement of an Earth escape uh, trajectory to get it on its way to the sun, which is really exciting. Um, so the Atlas V itself, we've flown, I think, when I was looking at our history, 10 other Earth escape trajectories with an Atlas V. So that's really exciting. So this will be our 137th launch um, total for United Launch Alliance um, since we formed back in 2006. This will be our 82nd Atlas V launch uh, since ULA's uh, formation. So very exciting. 
Um, we have a real, like you said, real heritage of flying these interplanetary missions, things like that. And so even our heritage vehicles, so previous iterations of the Atlas, so back in 1995, the SOHO mission uh, launched on an Atlas 2S. So that was before we were at ULA, that was a Lockheed Martin uh, Atlas. And that was actually another joint mission between ESA and NASA. So it's really exciting to kind of come full circle with this international collaboration on these um, solar missions. So it's really, really a big thing. Um, the other thing, we back in 2018, for those of you familiar, ULA launched the Parker Solar Probe. Some of you were here for that social, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. I was actually part of the social. Really? That's wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> so, you uh, recognize that's that? Okay. That's cool. I know it's yeah. the big group. Yeah. But. <laughs> so that mission, another mission to study the sun, closest object to fly um, to the sun. And so Solar Orbiter and Parker Solar Probe are actually going to be working in tandem to share data and correlate their data sets to just maximize the amount of information we learn from the sun. And so, for instance, Solar Orbiter, it gets so close to the sun that its cameras can't look directly at the sun or else it would damage the instrumentation. Solar Orbiter, um, however, isn't going to be quite as close to the sun and it's going to be doing direct um, photo observations of the sun that they can then correlate the data sets um, from the instrumentation that Parker Solar Probe records with the visual observations from Solar Orbiter and create a full story of what's going on with the sun. Um, so it's, it's really cool to see that collaboration between the various spacecraft as well. Um, so the Solar Orbiter uh, mission, like I said, it's a Earth escape uh, trajectory and so in order to get it in the right orbit, it'll be doing various flybys uh, with Venus and with Earth. Um, we call these gravity assists, and each time it passes uh, Venus and Earth, it'll shape its trajectory, get it a little bit closer to the sun, as well as change its inclination. So when it changes its inclination, um, it'll get more and more skewed towards the poles of the sun, so we can image the poles of the sun, something that's never done been done before. So. That's going to be very exciting to see the imagery that comes out of that, as well as the scientific data that comes from that. All right, did you want to share your video? Sure. So we've got a video that shows just kind of an overall um, mission profile of the mission. And you'll notice in the video, you'll see at liftoff, the main thrusters, or the main engines on the Atlas V vectoring <coughs> towards that SRV. You can already see it in this. Um, in this image of it, and you'll see how, how that vectors um, to stabilize the trajectory in flight. And liftoff of the United Launch Alliance Atlas V rocket. The Atlas V RD-180 main engine and one solid rocket booster ignite to generate more than 5.3 million newtons of thrust to lift the rocket on its way towards a hyperbolic escape trajectory. Shortly after liftoff, Atlas begins a pitch over to attain the proper flight path while minimizing the dynamic pressure the vehicle experiences during flight. The Atlas V reaches Mach 1, the speed of sound, at 58 seconds. The single SRB is jettisoned at 2 minutes 20 seconds. At 4 minutes 3 seconds, the propellant levels deplete and the booster engine shuts down. Six seconds later, the Atlas Centaur separation system activates to release the booster stage. The vehicle now weighs less than 14% of what it did at liftoff. Ten seconds later, the first burn of the Centaur main engine begins. This burn guides the Centaur into a near circular parking orbit. Approaching payload fairing jettison, the Centaur is burning propellant at a rate of 23 kilograms per second, traveling at more than 17,700 kilometers per hour and located nearly 134 kilometers in altitude and 470 kilometers downrange. At 4 minutes 27 seconds, the payload fairing is jettisoned. The vehicle now weighs less than 7% of what it did at liftoff, four and a half minutes earlier. 12 minutes 14 seconds into flight, cutoff of the Centaur main engine, or MECO-1, occurs. The mission now enters a coast phase in preparation for the second burn. 
Because this targeted Earth escape trajectory varies from day to day, the coast and the second burn will vary to accommodate this. The Centaur main engine is restarted at 42 minutes 58 seconds for the second and final engine burn. Nearly seven minutes later, final cutoff of the Centaur main engine occurs. At 52 minutes 40 seconds, Centaur releases Solar Orbiter for the European Space Agency and NASA to begin its nearly two-year journey to the Sun. After using gravity assist maneuvers at Earth and Venus, Solar Orbiter will help us understand how our star creates and controls the heliosphere, a giant bubble of charged particles blown by the solar wind that permeates the whole solar system and influences the planets within it. I myself am a hobbyist as well, and so kind of bringing it back to the uniqueness of the configurations of Atlas from a photographer's mindset. That's one of the things that really excites me about Atlas is your subject matter is always changing, very unique. You always want to capture every type of configuration possible of, of Atlas. Um, SRBs, I find, make photos really interesting um, just because there's so much dynamic stuff going on there. So a little bit of a just added bonus from a photographer's uh, perspective as far as the configuration um, or all the unique configurations that Atlas provides. I think my time's just about up. Any questions in the room? Sure. What's the maximum gimbal range for the main uh, It's about eight degrees. Eight degrees? Yeah. And they, they gimbal in the digit, right? so you got roll control? Yeah, they do. And what's, what's interesting about that engine is it looks, visually, it looks like two engines, but it's a single engine, and it's, it's, it's a technicality of how you find an engine, and it's really, the definition is your turbo machinery. It uses one set of turbo machinery to drive the fuel pumps into the combustion chamber, so two combustion chambers, two nozzles. Yes. Is the change in the orbital plane solely controlled by the Venus platform? Uh, that's what I understand. I, I'm not a trajectory expert, um, but just kind of at a high level, from what I understand, um, each pass of, of Venus is what will shape that um, orbital plane change. There's no like burns on this? Uh, that, I'm not quite sure. The, the spacecraft folks would probably know um, best what kind of burns they do throughout their, their trajectory. I'm sure they have some orbit maneuver burns, but I'm not totally versed on what their, their maneuvers are in space. Are you going to be working on this mission? Uh, so I worked um, as a support role on this mission. So my, my title is uh, Spacecraft Integration Engineer. Uh, so to me, I'm biased, but I think that's probably the, the coolest job you can have in the industry because you work directly with the spacecraft uh, customer mission team and then our ULA launch site team to basically get the two teams working together to ensure that uh, the spacecraft is integrated and ready for flight. So I got to support the primary integrator on this mission, um, helping out as needed. Um, for me, the highlight was getting to support spacecraft transport from um, the payload processing facility out to the BIF, and coming back to um, the whole really fun, collaborative, working with international partners aspect of it. One of the things that was really unique during that experience was um, one of the, the guys at uh, Airbus He's an avid, um, proficient bagpipe player. So he was standing in the payload processing facility wearing his uh, traditional uh, kilt, had his bagpipes, and as we rolled the spacecraft out of the facility, he was playing uh, bagpipes. So that was, that was a unique and cool experience. your photo on the forms, right? Yeah, so the, the spacecraft transport photo uh, was actually a photo I took during the transport. Appreciate that. That was a good photo. Thank you. Anything else from the room? Can you tell us a little bit about yourself, how you ended up in this career and sure, your definitely. background? Um, so in high school, uh, we had this um, magnet program, uh, or it was actually at the time, it was just a club. It was a little uh, model rocket club. I got joined into it. We competed at various um, international, or not international, but national competitions, and that sparked my interest to pursue a career in aerospace engineering. Uh, so I went to UCF, got my bachelor's degree in aerospace engineering, 
uh, graduated and worked for Lockheed Martin on another program for about six years. Um, stuck at the ULA career site for those entire six years, waiting for an opportunity to present itself. And finally, the right fit presented itself. Um, I jumped on it and I was fortunate and grateful enough to get hired. Um, in that time frame, I started picking up photography as a hobby and um, started getting more and more into the launch photography. And like I mentioned, during the Parker Solar Pro, I actually ended up getting some credentials to come out here and photograph that launch. And it was just serendipitous that it worked out that that same week was the week of my interview for um, ULA. And I kind of talked about the whole ph photography thing because I built my own system. Um, my own circuits and program them to, to trigger my cameras on the pad. So I like to think that my, my dabble in launch photography helped me get into the professional engineering aspect of uh, aerospace. So <laughs> it was a fun trajectory to get here. Anything else? Yep. Maybe you can answer this, maybe you can't. Uh, why did the European Space Agency decide to use an Atlas V launch from here instead of one of their rockets launching somewhere here? That I'm honestly not sure. I think it has something to do with the, the whole NASA partnership, um, but I'm not quite sure what goes into those decision making processes. Yeah. Anything else? Great, well, I appreciate everyone's time, and I hope you guys enjoy the launch. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.